They're late again. Herp, herp. What took you so damn long? This. Herp. Check it out, it's a Shaky Genesis 3! Hey, that's pretty cool. Did you bring the cables for it? Yeah, sure, I got them right over here. Ah, I can't hook it up. This TV doesn't have any RCA inputs. So, what are we supposed to do? Haven't you ever hooked up a really old video game system before? Uh, no. Well... Since the beginning of home video gaming, mankind has looked at his video game console and said to himself, How do I hook this thing up? This thing in question is the Atari 2600, a system that launched in 1977. The Atari 2600 is a good representative of RF video, as it exclusively outputs via this method, as did most really old video game systems from this era. RF, or radio frequency, was standard through the 70s to the mid-90s, and it worked like this. The console's video signal is sent through its internal RF modulator, and out the RF out port on the back of the system. This signal is then sent into a small box where it is converted to send the video and audio through a coaxical cable, where it screws on the back of the TV. On North American televisions, the video would come on channels 3 or 4. Another signal, for example a television antenna signal, could also be screwed onto a different part of the console's box, and can be switched back and forth to on a switch on the box itself. Most systems of this era supported RF, including the Atari 2600, whatever this thing is, the Model 1 Sega Genesis, the NES Top Loader, the original NES, the Super Nintendo, and the Sega Master Systems. Some of these systems could only use RF, whether because that was the only option at the time or as a cost-cutting method on a redesigned unit. Other systems offered RF as an option, and at the time, most people just used it anyways, but they did have far superior options available to these systems. So why was RF video necessary? For compatibility and convenience. As these old systems began to come out, televisions weren't made to accept different inputs like they were today. The only thing televisions took was an antenna signal. And, as far as I could tell, the RF video method turns the console's video into a sort of wired television broadcast straight to channel 3. And even to people who did have the newer televisions, for a lot of them, screwing in the coax cable was just easier and cheaper and more convenient. There was a cost to this method, however, which can be seen when you use one of these signals on a monitor display. The amount of compression required to fit the signal into this cable makes RF video look vastly inferior, and as AV inputs become to become standard, systems abandon this output altogether. Although, to those who really needed it, systems from the Nintendo 64, GameCube, and even up to the PlayStation 3 had RF adapters for their AV outports. But after radio frequency, RF, came the video signal titan known as... AV is likely what most people are familiar with, most notably the red, white, and yellow cables. Hey, I recognize those! Aha! Uh -huh. Referred to as composite video, this analog video standard uses three colored RCA cables to transfer the video and mono or stereo audio. That's right, all the video information is being pumped through the single yellow RCA wire. The colors, or chroma, the brightness, or luma, which is oddly abbreviated to Y, the sync, everything with a small, easy to use, readily available connector which dominated the back end to the most nostalgic and well known video game consoles of all time. The yellow composite cable's red and white companions handle the audio, with the left and right audio lines being split to the two cables. Unlike composite video, this duo was used even outside of the realm of video for audio equipment in home theaters before, during, and after composite video's time. The RCA cable is, after all, named after its company creation, the Radio Corporation of America, for use with, well, radio and audio equipment. Composite video is supported by a large variety of consoles, including... The NES, the Master System, the Sega Genesis, the Super Nintendo, the Turbo Graphics, whatever the heck, the other Genesis, the Sega Saturn, the Sony PlayStation, the Nintendo 64, the PlayStation 2, the GameCube, the Xbox, the Wii, and even some HDMI systems such as the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Wii U through the previous console's AV cables. And the Wii Mini. 
I asked a ton of people on Discord what they thought of when they saw an image of composite AV cables, and I got some pretty good answers, such as the 1990s, CRT televisions, traumatic flashbacks of the Nintendo Wii, GameCube, bad video quality, childhood nightmares, AV. Basically exactly what they are. Any kind of television. Old consoles, DVD players, and the Nintendo Wii. Even more CRT televisions. Plug and play games. Maybe don't read this one. Mysterious portable Pac-Man thingy. Start cables cause I'm in your The Sony PlayStation. Genesis. Genesis. Gen- VCR and GameCube. Oh. As you can see, composite video became the basic standard throughout the 90s and early 2000s for video game consoles. But it wasn't the only option and there was only one way to go but up. That is to say that composite video's quality is quite dark and muddy 480i due to it being crammed through one RCA cable at 15 kilohertz. It's definitely a step up from RF, but especially on modern displays and capture, it looks especially awful since the CRT effect can't mask the weak 480i signal. But what if you want to bump up from composite? What's the next best thing to this 480i interlaced, blurry, poor, but nostalgic mess? Then look no further than S-Video. This larger cable is similar to composite, but this cable separates the chroma and luma line down two separate wires inside of the cable itself. This way, a cleaner image can be generated. In my opinion, the leap from composite to S-Video is huge, and considering the amount of consoles that support it, I love to take advantage of it whenever I can if it's the best or cheapest option on a console. S-Video is supported by the Super Nintendo, the Sega Saturn, the Sony PlayStation, the Nintendo 64, the GameCube, the Xbox, the PlayStation 2, the Nintendo Wii, and, again, some HDMI systems that have the previous console's AV outputs. Here's some examples of a composite image versus an S-Video image. The difference doesn't manifest as much in capture, but pay attention to the edges of parts of the image. See how S-Video is less smudged and muddy compared to the composite image? S-Video is great, and during the 1990s, it was THE premium cable, and it's even on many early flat-screen HDTVs. If you have it, I recommend taking advantage of it when you can, especially on consoles like the GameCube, where higher quality cables are hundreds of dollars more expensive or region exclusive. The problem is, it started disappearing on flat-screen TVs that kept other analog inputs, and at this point, HDTVs have left this powerful but less known input for years now. There are plenty of adapters for HDMI if you really need to use it. But that's not the only stop on this journey, and analog video can get even better than S-Video. Enter component As the 1990s came to a close, gaming kind had finally been shown the power of the third dimension. The Sony PlayStation had pushed cinematic storytelling and reshuffled the major players. The Nintendo 64 continued to push the envelope of what gaming could feel and play like. And hell, even the Sega Saturn has its place in history. Now looking towards the future, the legendary sixth generation of consoles was on the horizon, and it was time for things to get really crazy. The world of electronics was changing, and it was time for a final hoorah from the analog age. At least here in North America. The PlayStation 2 launched in the year of 2000, and it was the first gaming console to support YPP PR video, also known as Component Video. Component Video is a broad term that describes color being split into multiple cables or lines, but the term is most synonymous with these five cables. Y, P, B, P, R cables. Like last time, the two white and red cables carry audio, and the video is split between the green, blue, and the other red line. Funny enough, the green line doesn't even carry green. It carries Y, which, as previously established, is brightness, or luma, as well as the sync value. Plugging just this in will provide a black and white image. The blue line, P, B, carries not just blue, but the difference between Y and blue. The red line, P, R, Similarly, carries the difference between Y and red. Plugging in just the PB and or PR cable will cause the TV to not detect any image due to a missing sync signal. 
Swapping the cables around will sort of invert a bunch of the colors, except for green, because the green information is inferred by what is left over from the PB, PR, and Y lines. The higher bandwidth compared to 15kHz composite in this video allows resolutions uh, higher than 240p and 480i, such as 480p. 480i, or 480 interlaced, is the resolution used by composite and S-Video. Component video is supported by the PlayStation 2, the Nintendo GameCube, the original Xbox, the Nintendo Wii, and the same three HD systems. A lot less, I know. But, the signal is convenient and readily available, and in many cases, is a good option if you can find it at a decent price. Something that will never happen with the GameCube. The GameCube's component cables use a very strange and proprietary converter in the cable itself, which plugged into a special digital output sat next to the AV port which the GameCube shares with the Super Nintendo, AV Famicom, and Nintendo 64. These cables were only sold on Nintendo's website in the early 2000s and have long since been discontinued, and are now being sold for over $200 on eBay. Even worse, the digital output was removed in later GameCube models, as it was seldom used, so with the GameCube I've stick to S-Video in NTSC regions and RGB in PAL regions. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. RGB, PAL regions, what are you talking about? Well, that's where things get a little spicy. RGB is outputted commonly in Europe only, or PAL regions, through this connector, the SCART connector. This video output is extremely crisp and clean, especially through professional upscaling equipment, but North American or NTSC televisions were never equipped to handle it. Consoles that can use RGB in this format include the Master System, Genesis or Mega Drive, Super Nintendo, Sega Saturn, the first three Playstations, and only in PAL regions, the Nintendo 64, GameCube, Wii, and Xbox consoles. Meanwhile, on the computer side of things, computers mainly used another form of RGB, called VGA, through a connector known as D sub 15. VGA and SCART RGB are very different, with VGA not even touching audio. Even though this connector's analog nature has made it technically obsolete in the computer world compared to DVI and HDMI today, blad for which is a whole other topic, it is still included on a surprising amount of home computers and monitors due to its long usage by many, even to this day. Of course, all of this is just barely scratching the surface of all these video outputs especially analog ones. The RCA connector is used for so many things and has so many other color variants outside of the realm of video and even inside the realm of video. But for now, this is all I can do with this crummy old TV and computer inside a sewer. That's well, all well and good, but how do we hook up this Sega Genesis? Well, we need a new TV.